kind of problem that a protein biochemist could hope for. Too much protein. I know it sounds silly, but too much protein can actually be a bit of a pain, especially once in a lot of volume. So right now we have 30 mils worth of protein dialyzing down in the cold room to get the salt out, the aminosol out more specifically, and put some glycerol in to freeze it. And that's not even all of our protein. So in that 30 mils, there's like 40 migs of protein from like 400 mils of culture. This protein expressed like a beast. Don't feel bad if your proteins don't. It's really, really protein specific. But anyway, we have so much protein that we had to kind of get rid of some of it, like waste some of the protein. And so how do we actually know which fractions, which portions of protein to keep? Basically, let me step back a second. We're doing protein purification using a histag protein. So the protein, we told these E. coli to make this maladehydrogenase protein from Bacillus subtilis, so from a different type of bacteria, and to put a tag on the end of it, put a string of amino acid histidine. Now the amino acid histidine, it's got this like ring on the end that binds to metals, um, so it'll bind to nickel, and then we had nickel um, in a column in here, you can see here, we've got this column and it's got this nickel resin. And so there's nickel on the resin and our protein's got the histidine tag and it'll bind to the resin. We wash other stuff off and then we can pee off our protein with the midazol, which is basically just that ring portion of histidine. So our protein's able to bind to the resin really well because it's got the whole string of histidines, the hist tag. So it's basically just six or eight histidines in a row. And basically it'll then chelate or ah, grab on tightly to the metal. And then it will uh, bind tightly while other stuff flows through. Now, if some stuff happens to have some histidine on there already, like in the protein, because, well, proteins have histidine, histidine is one of our amino acids, um, then they can bind, like, non-specific binding, but they won't have that whole string of them, so they're not going to bind as tightly. So we can push our protein off, and we can prevent those other proteins from coming um, using amidazole, which is that just that ring portion. So if we have a low concentration of amidazole, like in our binding buffers and in our wash buffers, um, that low concentration, it'll prevent that other stuff from binding. And if it does bind, we can kind of wash it off. Well, our protein is still going to stay stuck because it's got that whole string of amidazole. And when you've got that whole string, you've got that chelation effect, you've got that kind of like group effect where one's bound, this one's next to it. It's like increasing the local concentration of the of histidine so you can bind more tightly. Therefore, you're going to need more imidazole in order to push your protein off. The tighter your protein's bound, the more imidazole you need. That will depend on things like where the tag is when your protein gets all folded up. Like, does it end up all hidden inside or is it out on the surface? Um, if you have problems with your protein not binding when it has a tag, you might want to try changing to the other terminus, um, extending the linker, that sort of thing. More on that in other posts. But bottom line is proteins can bind with different strengths to the resin. Um, and so you will have to have some concentration of aminosol, some higher concentration of aminosol to push your protein off, but you don't know what that concentration will actually be. And you don't want to kind of have more aminosol than you need because the aminosol is gonna cause problems later on, which is why we're doing this dialysis, where basically we have a pouch holding our protein. The protein is too big to get through the pouch, but the aminosol is small enough to go out. Um, and But the aminosol can also come in so that's why we have this huge volume. So we have like four liters of this. Um, and then we have another couple, um, three liters for in the morning for a swap out. Because basically what happens in dialysis is your protein, um, the, the little things go in and the little things go out. Um, you want the things to go out that you don't want anymore and the things that come in that you do want, like the glycerol in our buffer on the outside so that we can freeze it and wake it up and it'll be nicer, um, hopefully still work. And basically, you still don't want to freeze thaw a lot though, and so that's why we're going to have to aliquot all this into little portions, which is why one of the problems with having a big, big volume, in addition to kind of the hassle with the dialysis buffer, where basically the more volume you have, the more volume of dialysis buffer you're going to need in order to really dilute all of that aminosol out as much as possible. And so basically because you reach that equilibrium or things inside equal things outside, the bigger you have outside, the more you can dilute it, the lower the concentration of aminosol outside will be. Um, and then you swap it out and you can get even more aminosol out um, and that sort of thing. So you don't want to have too much aminosol though because the more aminosol you start with, the harder it is to get rid of it all. So volume's a hassle because you have to have like a bigger, more in your pouch and all this stuff. And then later on, you've got a bunch to aliquot. 
and you don't want to have too much of a dissolve. So those are kind of like the key things to keep in mind when you're thinking about which fractions to combine. Assuming, of course, that you have a gradient. So we did a stepwise gradient where basically we had 10, 10 mil portions where we gradually ramped up the concentration of imidazole. Now, if you're doing something on like an ACTA, an FPLC machine, where you can actually make like a linear gradient with gradually increasing imidazole and then watch the UV peak come off where your protein comes off, then you know like how much imidazole it took to get your protein off um, and you see it come off and all's good. But if you're doing things gravity throw like we are um, without a UV detector, well here you can use the Bradford, which is what I was doing. Um, but basically to make the gradient, we basically combined, um, we did like one to nine uh, wash buffer, which had a low imidazole, and then a Lucian buffer, which had the high imidazole. You basically just mix fraction ratios of them and then collect the portions. But how do you know which portions you actually want if you don't have the UV detector? And that's where Bradford comes in. So Bradford isn't the name of my friend, well, kind of, um, but Bradford is a reagent. Um, it's a chemical that basically, it's a dye that changes color when it binds to proteins, and it turns a blue color. The more protein there is, the bluer it'll get, and you can kind of watch the blue come off. What we did was we used a multi-channel pipette, so it's got lots of um, things, in order to transfer 100 microliters of Bradford into the different wells of the plate. And basically, we just then, as the protein came off, we were taking 10 mils of those 10, or 10 microliters of those 10 mil portions, mixing it with 100 of Bradford, seeing when it turned blue. What we wanted to see was that basically our flow through, so that's where we just take our protein, like take the lysate that we mix with the beads, the resin, um, and basically anything that's not bound is just going to flow through. And so we collect that, and then we do a wash. The wash there has the binding buffer, so it's the same buffer that our protein is currently in. Um, we equilibrated the resin. Basically, we just got the resin like bound uh, or equilibrated basically like the, all the liquid inside the resin all the re liquid around the resin was going to be our buffer instead of just like the storage solution um it's the same buffer that our protein's in which has that really low amount of imidazole we did like five millimolar at those concentrations you prevent really non-specific binding um but you still have some non-specific binding and then hopefully most of it's your protein you don't want to go too high in the imidazole with your binding buffer or else your protein won't bind um but the higher you can go with your protein still binding and preventing other stuff from binding in the first place the less you have to wash off in your washes and so then you do the washes and we did a couple different washes so we did a wash with the binding buffer then we did two washes we did like three washes actually with the um with the wash buffer which had like 10 millimolar imidazole and we ended up doing three of them because we were monitoring with at the bradford and we saw that basically what you can see is that in the washes, we got, we we're getting rid of the protein, but we still have a little bit in there. And it was hard to know actually whether that was because that was what our, was coming off the column, like right that moment or beforehand. Because when you collect it all coming off into a big fraction, you're not really getting a granular view about what came off first and what came off last. It all just kind of mixes together. So what I like to do is like take a drop right from the drop, like the last drop that's coming off, when, you, when it's drop, dripping out, it's kind of got that little bubble stuck in the bottom. Just like take that bubble pull out. Um, and what we saw with that, it was basically, um, at that point, the protein was pretty much gone. So then we started ramping up the imidazole and we saw that peak five, peak six, peak seven, peak eight, these were where we had most of our protein. Um, and so, but how much, and then it started like tapering off as all the protein came off. So you see eight, nine, um, 10, 11, blah, blah, blah. So you can see that we're getting protein out until like pretty much the very end almost. Not quite, um, but uh, there's a lot of protein. and But it's spread over a very large volume. And the problem with that is, like I've talked about, you don't want a very large volume. And the other problem is that the ones at the end have the highest concentration of imidazole. And so we want to avoid a higher concentration of imidazole if possible and avoid having a super large volume if possible. So we wanted to prioritize which ones we took and so we decided to take just these highest concentration ones. And so we might wonder, why didn't we take wash four? Wash four it doesn't have quite as high of a concentration, but it still looks like it's got a lot of protein. But that was our lowest concentration of imidazole. And so we thought, well, maybe there's still some non-specific stuff there. So it was better to take one that's a little higher imidazole, avoid any like non-specific stuff, and just get our protein. Then we basically said, okay, these ones have a high concentration. Let's keep those. Um, it starts tapering off. Let's let's not worry about those. Probably, but let's go and let's check when we have enough protein first. So we can kind of tell we had a ton of protein, but how much protein? 
And so that's why we did a, a standard curve with um, BSA. We made a standard curve in order to actually measure the concentration of our protein to know what, what it is concentration-wise, to make sure that we, have, we really do have a lot and that, well, also that it's not too high of a concentration that we risk it crashing out or basically precipitating because it's too high of a concentration. So that's how we kind of like prioritize what fractions to keep. Ideally, if we had time and if we had money, um, we would do an SDS page gel where we basically look at the purity of the different fractions and only combine those that look the purest. Um, but it was getting late and we're using SDS page gels that expired in 2015. I said, okay, well, these are probably our protein. Um, we're at a higher aminosol. Other things have probably washed out based on our last protein purification. It's probably our stuff. And so let, let's run a bit. And so that's what we did. Um, and so tomorrow we will run an SDS page gel of them, hopefully after they've successfully dialyzed out the imidazole without crashing. Um, so when I come in in the morning, I'm hoping that in the dialysis pouch, it's still all clear, not all cloudy. And then the next test will be, okay, well, let's go and let's measure the concentration now. Uh, make sure that we ever see what our final concentration is. Um, go ahead and run that SDS page, see how pure it is, run an activity assay to see that it's active, um, and compare its activity, start comparing its activity to the activity of the maladehydrogenase from Sapensis that we purified last week, um, and then we can go and do all sorts of cool stuff. But this was just kind of like one of the things that we're doing, um, is to kind of, I'm just passing on some of the wisdom about protein purification, showing him how to do things like look and see if you got good lysis because you can kind of see it clear up a little. Um, even if your sonicator is on the fritz, um, you could kind of then, okay, well, it doesn't look like it's really lysed now. Oh, now it looks like it's sliced. And then afterwards, yeah, you get those nice rings. And so if you're not sure what I'm talking about, go check out the post on the sonication and on the lysis and all that stuff. I have posted on all of these things. Um, right now I'm going to go run and catch the bus and get some sleep and I'm really looking forward to hopefully this protein not crashing and then being able to really see how pure it is and test it out and that sort of thing. Yeah, we ended up with so much protein, um, so that's why we knew we could kind of, we could, it's okay if we don't get it all, um, we could, it's better to kind of keep some out than to be overwhelmed with how much protein. Um, if we really, really wanted all the yield, we just pull all those fractions together, um, especially if we're doing some later step. If we really cared about purity, we would run that gel and just take the really pure ones. Um, if you're doing some sort of next step um, where you're doing a concentrating step, like some sort of anion exchange chromatography or cation exchange, where basically your protein is going to get stuck to another column, then you don't really care as much about the volume. Or if you've got like a big huge column that you can run manually um, but when you're dealing with like dialysis and a little pouch and stuff yeah um, smaller volumes better um, we we're afraid of concentrating it though um, because we've been warned that at higher concentrations and some MDHs can actually crash out we're avoiding that um, tomorrow we might try concentrating some we're probably gonna freeze some of it in the little aliquots, like 30 microliter aliquots and PCR strips like we did before. But 30 mils is a ton of tiny little PCR strips. So we'll probably save some of it, um, concentrate some of it, test its limits a little, um, and maybe um, send some to collaborators for some cool things. So we're really excited and yeah, have a great day.